Yeah. 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 Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. It's time again to listen to Karina Altman try to tell us how modern animal diversity came from the Ark. So far, she has done this by mostly listening off neat animals and then alleging that they're in a single biblical kind. Let's see what she has in store for us today as we dive back into the stupid. He tried to force it to be a driving force behind evolution because he believed if given enough time, natural selection could create new animals. But this is incorrect because natural selection is actually the opposite of evolution. You are losing genetic information. You are not gaining it. Well, first, it is getting new animals. Because even if we stick to things you said are related, like all frogs, producing a cane toad, a hairy frog, and a poison dart frog requires new animals because those things aren't the same animal and they're not the same animal that would have gotten off of your arc. And no one claims that natural selection produces variation. That's mutations. Your need to argue against a straw man of evolution does not strengthen your case. If anything, it makes you seem like you can't actually argue against what evolution really is. So, natural selection is simply a mechanism God uses to allow organisms to adapt to their environments. I mean, sure, I'll just grant you God's bare existence, and so all things that happen must be allowed to happen by God, assuming he's omnipotent. But that's not really a meaningful statement. If God exists and is omnipotent, then X happened and God allowed X to happen, are identical statements in terms of the meaning behind them. Because all the things that God doesn't allow simply don't happen. Evolution requires the creation of new genetic material. However, natural selection decreases or eliminates genetic material. Hey, you're right. Good thing there's a well-known mechanism for increasing genetic material, because without it, even your arc idea with kinds diversifying after dispersal from the arc wouldn't work. I mean, it still doesn't work with that mechanism, but it would work even less well without it. So here's two more examples. Your environment is going to determine which of the genetics in that animal are going to be selected for. For instance, you've got these two types of goat. So this one up here, this is a mountain goat. They're from the Rockies here in America. They can live up to 13,000 feet high, and they live among snow and ice on the cliffs. And it gets pretty cold, so this thick, fluffy winter coat does really well up there to help it camouflage and stay warm. However, next to it, this is a Nubian ibex. They're from the deserts of northern Africa, where it's very hot and arid, and it's very brown. So they've got that short brown coat to help them blend into the desert and stay cool, and that coat actually helps reflect heat and radiation. Now, this goat would not do well up in the Rockies, and this goat would not do well in the deserts of Africa, right? But they're both part of the same animal kind. They're not changing into anything else. They're just being genetically selected for the best way to survive their environment. Okay, there's nothing in that that really contradicts evolution, especially since you won't define kind. I'm honestly not sure what the point of that was. Neat animals, though. So one of the biggest uh, evidences that they try to tell you for natural selection would be Darwin's finches. Now, these are actually not finches. They are tanagers. It's a totally different kind of bird. So with birds, we're back to family-level kinds, huh? I wonder why. But also, what about doves? They're in the same superfamily as tanagers, that is, Passeroidea. Why can't they be in the same kind? We can't say, because you didn't tell us. So what he likes to say is these guys evolved different beak types depending on what food was most prevalent on the island of the Galapagos that they were native to. And to prove that that's false, all you have to do is prove that they don't have a common ancestor. But you think they do, so that's out. The other option is to show that the beak structure is not determined by different genomes. Let's see if you make that argument, because otherwise they did evolve, because that's what evolution is. So this guy does really well eating seeds, whereas the other guy does really well with buds and fruit. This guy eats um, leaves, and this guy eats insects. So each of their beaks changed, they like to say evolved, to help them eat best on whatever island. However, again, this is not evolution. You can't just state that and let it go. Why isn't that evolution? It meets the definition of change in a population's allele frequency over time. New tanagers evolve from the ancestral tanagers through changes to their genomes. They're still finches. They're not turning into anything else. Well, I thought they were tanagers, and I took your word for it, but I guess now they're finches. I don't really care either way. But if they turned into non-finches, it would be against the laws of evolution. In evolution, there is common descent. So the original finch, since that's what we're going with now, gave rise to new finches. And let's just call one of those finches 
the Galapagos finch. That finch would give rise to new Galapagos finches, but they wouldn't stop being finches, or birds, or amniotes, or tetrapods, etc. And they can't even stop being Galapagos finches, because that's a clade. That is, all the descendants of a common ancestor, plus that ancestor. Once a population starts a clade, all future descendants will be in that clade. Even if in a hundred million years some Galapagos finches become a featherless, scaly, T-Rex-sized super predator that can't fly, it'll still be a Galapagos finch. Their beaks are just best adapted to the food sources on their Galapagos island. So these guys are going to do really well on an island full of seeds, but birds that look like this are going to die out, right? You're losing that genetic information. Okay, but there's already too much genetic information, and I use the term loosely, for it to have all been present in a single pair of breeding birds. We know it had to arise, so losing genetic information from natural selection doesn't preclude universal common descent, because adding information to the genome is trivial and observed routinely in nature. So, in conclusion, natural selection can decrease genetic information and adapt animals to their habitats, as well as eliminate the weak and sick organisms. It cannot create new genetic information or allow organisms to evolve from molecules to man. Well, that's true, although I don't know why you threw the last one in there. Obviously, natural selection can't work until it has something to select, and that can't happen until you have a genetic system, which is quite a few steps into the sequence of having abiotic simple chemicals form into highly derived apes like humans. But no one thinks that natural selection drove abiogenesis. So next we'll talk about mutations. So this is a white-tailed deer here with piebaldism, which makes it kind of patchy, so it's white and normal colored. Now it's really beautiful, but this mutation is not ideal in the wild because that fawn is going to stand out to predators like a sore thumb, right? So mutations are typically not good things. In its current environment, yes. But what if it entered a new environment where stands of brownish vegetation were interrupted by stretches of light-colored terrain? then it might well be better than the standard countershaded deer coloration. And the thing is, you already know this, because earlier you said that beneficial traits are beneficial in an organism's environment, and that if the environment changes, then which traits are beneficial will change. So piebald coloring may well be advantageous in certain environments. So what is a mutation? It is a permanent change to the DNA of an organism. Again, it is not a gain of information. You are not evolving. You are losing or changing the information that was already there. Uh, no. <laughs> From the level of a species genome, every mutation increases information because every mutation must be recorded separately if you want to keep a whole species genome record. You can't simply say by fiat that mutations decrease information. Just look at your piebald deer example. Was information lost? It now has a new pattern it didn't have before. And also we can see the original spotted pattern of juvenile deer is still there. That seems like more information just on the face of it. There is no mutation that results in the gain of new genetic traits required for molecules to man evolution. Again, because the first steps of that process wouldn't be evolutionary or involve a genome. So I don't know what your point is. So here's another example um, of mutation. This is albinism. So all mutations, even beneficial ones, are a loss or variation of pre-existing genetic traits. Well, yeah, but that variation can increase the information and even preserve the old information. For example, we know that more than one line of fish has evolved proteins that act as antifreeze, allowing them to survive in the extreme cold of the polar oceans. And the way this happens is that a gene is duplicated, resulting in two functioning copies of a gene that produces some protein. Then one copy mutates to form a new protein that inhibits the formation of ice crystals. And bam, new protein. Old protein is still there, new genetic information. So this is actually a tawny frog mouth here. These are birds from Australia, and they are ambush predators. So they rely on holding still and waiting for their prey to come to them. Now, a normal tawny frog mouth blends in perfectly to a tree. I don't know if you've ever seen these guys in zoos, but sometimes they're very difficult to see because their camouflage is so great, and they depend on that for survival. So this guy, even though he's got this mutation that looks, makes him look really pretty, he's not going to do well out in the wild, right? Because he's going to stand out, and all of his prey is going to run away from him. He's not going to be able to catch any food. Well, it is gaining information, and yeah, it's probably not beneficial in any context a tawny frogmouth is likely to encounter. But so what? So even though this is a cool mutation and it didn't kill him, he's not going to do well at all in the wild. It is not evolution at all. It's not gaining new information. It's not even beneficial. 
I'll agree, most mutations are not beneficial to most organisms in the environments in which they find themselves. So most mutations do have those neutral or negative effects, like this albinism. Well done. You found a scientist pointing out that an area of evolutionary biology needs more research. I wonder if during the subsequent years we can find any other biologists finding mechanism for the formation of novel traits. Well, here's the abstract of one such paper titled Multiple Recent Co-Options of Optics Associated with Novel Traits in Adaptive Butterfly Wing Radiations by Arnold Martin, Kyle J. McCullough, Nipom H. Patel, Adriana D. Briscoe, Lawrence E. Gilbert, and Robert D. Reed, published February 5, 2014, in the spring volume of the journal Nature. Quote, While the ecological factors that drive phenotypic radiations are often well understood, less is known about the generative mechanisms that cause the emergence and subsequent diversification of novel features. Heliconius butterflies display an extraordinary diversity of wing patterns due in part to mimicry and sexual selection. Identifying the genetic drivers of this crucible of evolution is now within reach, as it was recently shown that cis-regulatory variation in the optics transcription factor explains red pattern differences in the adaptive radiations of the Heliconius melpomene and Heliconius erratos species groups, unquote. Here's another one. This time, neo-functionalization of embryonic head patterning genes facilitates the positioning of novel traits on the dorsal head of adult beetles, by Eduardo E. Zatara, Hannah A. Busey, David M. Linz, Yoshinori Tomoyasu, and Armin P. Mochek published July 13th, 2016, in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. I'm not going to quote the whole abstract, as it's long, but they found that mutations in a particular group of Hox genes can cause new traits to evolve in the head ornamentation of beetles. So while evolution of novel traits isn't the best understood thing in the world, it's not like it's a complete mystery or impossible. All right, so here is an um, excerpt from a paper called The Golden Age for Evolutionary Genetics in the Trends in Genetics magazine. It says, most studies of recent evolution involve the loss of traits, and we still understand little of the genetic changes needed in the origin of novel, which means new, traits. Over the broad sweep of evolutionary time, what we would really like to explain is the gain of complexity in the origins of novel adaptations. Ooh, that's embarrassing. I pre-debunked this with two citations even newer than yours. Sorry about that. So even evolutionists admit that none of these methods are really answering their questions on how animals could evolve because they all involve the loss of traits or the loss of genetic information. How about, say, the Milano mutation, which shields humans from heart disease by causing changes to the structure of apolipoprotein, which results in humans with the mutation being basically immune to increases in chances of cardiovascular disease from high HDL cholesterol levels. That sure seems beneficial, given that heart disease is the number one cause of death in most industrial countries. There you go. I found a beneficial mutation. Now, sometimes you'll hear about so-called beneficial mutations. Now, some mutations can certainly be unique, but they're not truly beneficial. So this is a fruit fly. They often use fruit flies in genetic experiments because they breed very quickly. It's got four wings. That's really cool. But it's not actually very helpful to that fly. He can't fly at all. So it's cool, it's unique, but it's not actually helping him. Oh, so there are beneficial mutations. And like you already agreed earlier in this speech, traits are only beneficial in a given environment, so you've refuted yourself. Congratulations! It's like I don't even need to be here sometimes. And in fact, that's where I'm going to call it for this episode. There's been a lot of talk about mutations, most of it nonsense, but that's okay. If you like this video, please remember to hit the like button, and if you're not already subscribed, please do so. If you want to make sure that you're always notified whenever there's new Dapper Dino content, hit the bell icon. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching. But before you go, I'd like to take some time to thank my patrons, especially my $20 and above patrons, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Henry Hutanen, Bob Knob, The Evil Scotsman, and Ben Hovind. As you know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and my patrons give me much-needed stability. If you'd like to join the team, there's a link in the description to my Patreon, which starts at $1. If you'd like, I also have a link to my Teespring store and an Amazon wishlist.